all electric homes that do not have attached garages wouldn't even need uh, carbon monoxide detectors. So, um, would it surprise you to learn that they said the same thing about smoke detectors? Really? Yes. yes. <laughs> no. I missed the smoke detector. <laughs> well, lucky you. Discussion. But that's the same thing we had then. Okay. Not new. Not new. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I did want to bring up commercial properties to see what you all think about requiring uh, carbon monoxide detectors in commercial properties if they have fuel burning devices. If we did have an incident, I can't remember exactly when it was, some years ago. Uh, in within a, the last decade. Within the last decade, yes. Um, and that was a commercial building and we were very lucky that people just got sick and that they didn't, didn't die. So I would like to get your input on that to see if we should go with commercial buildings as well, if they, if they qualify. So um, Chief Troxell had indicated to me in the past that he w recommends that carbon monoxide detectors are UL approved, that they have a digital readout, that they're AC with battery backup, but not lithium batteries. Um, and I had a couple of questions for the chief before you, the rest of you have an opportunity to ask questions of the chief. Um, I read the article regarding uh, Dr. Ryan's study and apparently there's a pretty high, I think the chief said a 35% failure rate when uh, Dr. Ryan checked uh, carbon monoxide detectors. And that's kind of scary. And so I, I asked the chief if his recommendation of a digital readout would help solve that problem. Can you tell me what your answer, can you tell us what your answer was to that, Chief Troxell? Well, having not seen uh, Dr. Ryan's study and how it was evaluated, I can only say that if the detectors that he uh, looked at failed because of a sensitivity or monitoring issue, the LED would not... Wouldn't have anything to do with that. Have any impact because it's a sensing issue, uh, and if it doesn't sense it, it doesn't make any difference on an LED readout or an alarm readout. So, uh, so it's difficult to speak to that simply because I haven't seen uh, Dr. Ryan's report. But since you recommended the digital digital uh, readout, you must think that it, it's a good thing to have that so that you can check on the levels yourself. Well, we believe. Over the last several years, and the number of runs that we've had, that for us to arrive on scene and at least be able to to look and see what the detector has read, whether it be you know 200 parts per million, 50 parts per million, it gives us some idea of the uh, seriousness of the situation. If we arrive on scene and there's only two or three parts per million at that time, and we're still going to be concerned. We're going to still check the house out, and, uh, and probably if we don't find anything, we'll leave a we call a mini tube, which is simply a mini uh, CO detector tube that you can snap the ends off of, and you can leave it in the house, for, and uh, it will monitor for up to seven or so days. And if that tube turns color, turns a dark green or a blackish color, uh, then they know that they have some still have carbon monoxide issues. It's a way that we feel better about uh, leaving the residence, even though we didn't find anything. Because many times the guys get there and people have opened the windows, opened the doors, and then the place is vented. So we, we don't know. You know, we'll go through with our meters, check uh, all the appliances that we can, but still, uh, there's always that little nagging in the back of your head. So we started using these, and we found that those work very well as sort of a backup to. Uh, Anybody's still staying in that uh, residence. Have you um, had positive tests with those tubes after you've checked the house? They helped indicate that we had the uh, presence of CO and, and uh, got the gas company involved. And, uh, generally, the situation is remedied. Whether it was a faulty furnace, which you know, we used to see a lot of faulty furnaces, especially when the high efficiency furnaces first came out. 
we were seeing a lot of heat exchangers fail due mm -hmm. to the, the hot uh, uh, temperatures that these furnaces operated on. Yeah, we were starting to see uh, heat exchangers fail fairly soon after those furnaces were installed, which uh, gave us high levels of CO at the, the house. And you indicated that um, they should be on the same level of the house as well, the bedroom. That's, that's my opinion. And CO basically is, is very close to one in, in the density. It's like 0.9 something. So it, it's, it's going to hover. Um, uh, it can elevate to some degree, but uh, the way I look at it is I'm concerned about individuals when they're sleeping. Uh, let's get it down into the, where that area that they're sleeping in, and uh, if we have uh, some, some CO, it'll at least detect it at that level, can wake people up, and we can uh, we can hopefully remedy the issue. The biggest thing we don't want to have occur is is high levels of CO go undetected for several days. Uh, you, you know, people will exhibit exhibit flu-like symptoms, uh, and it, progressively get worse and uh, you know ultimately uh, death uh, in more severe situations but, uh, how, how long does it take for death to occur at a high level not very long like an hour two hours uh, less than that less and than an high hour levels yeah, it will, it will, and, if, and I, I forget the exact numbers but if I, if I remember my old study in, in uh, anatomy that the uh, red blood cells absorb carbon monoxide something like 1,700 times more readily than it does oxygen. So if you have oxygen and carbon monoxide and they have their choice, red blood cells have their choice, they're going to go uh, to the carbon monoxide and absorb it uh, more readily. So That's pretty scary. Uh, it, it is a very serious condition. Yeah. Uh, you know, not, we don't always only see this. Uh, in houses that uh, are heated with hydrocarbon type appliances, fuel oil, natural gas. Uh, but we've seen over the years too that when we have power failures, uh, that for whatever reason people believe that they can take generators into their basement. Oh my goodness. And that's in themselves with the carbon monoxide. Uh, Accumulating into the basement, then migrating up into the upper floors. So uh, it is a serious issue, and you know, we have the ability, I think, in, in the city to, to some degree, help protect. Now, whether Dr. Ryan's study is, you know, is accurate, and I have no reason, certainly, to believe that it isn't. Uh, there's a lot of CO detectors that are on the market, uh, and, and you have to believe that that the UL listing of those detectors has to matter to some degree. Uh, and I certainly, if I had to choose between putting one in or not putting one in, even though Dr. Ryan's report indicates a 35% failure rate, I believe that was the correct percentage. I would still, I have one in my house. And I have one in my I rental do. house. I do too. I do too. And don't have to have, but I think in good conscience, uh, not having one is certainly not very wise. And we have the ability uh, here as, as a city to require those, at least in our rental units that uh, uh, that we have here in the city. And I think it's only prudent to do that. Uh, I mean, the cost of these things to me is, is insignificant. They're basically throwaway units now. Aren't they about $50 or maybe less? Yes. Yes. I, I think it's certainly in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, another question that I had was, um, you had recommended uh, carbon monoxide detectors that they be AC with battery backup, and um, and I ask you, do you mean that they should be hardwired or could they be plug-ins? 
tell you what I have at the house. And I have the type that simply plugs in a, a wall receptacle. Usually wall receptacles are about 12 inches from the floor. And it has a battery backup. I like battery backups because you have a power failure. Mm -hmm. and, if, and people turn their furnaces on, either with generators or they'll turn their ovens on, they'll turn their burners on. All that stuff produces carbon monoxide. And generally, people are trying to stay warm, so they don't want to open a window to introduce oxygen and fresh air into the house. So consequently, you have carbon monoxide building up uh, when the power's on. Right. So to have a battery backup, I think, is, uh, is wise. And the life of a carbon monoxide detector, is that about seven years now? I mean, I they don't last on forever. Who, whose literature you read, five, seven, ten, uh, I, I think you go with the manufacturer's recommendation on, on these, uh, the life expectancy of these units. You know, some of them you look at, uh, same with smoke detectors, they're recommending ten years, get rid of them. Uh, even though the battery still may be functional, mm -hmm. they believe that uh, 10 years the detectors are no longer uh, reliable. So they should be replaced periodically? Yes. Okay. Anybody else have questions for Chief Troxel? Member Sands? Um, Chief, you mentioned um, one, everybody ought to have one. Um, but with, with smoke detectors, we require that there might there will be several throughout a house. Mm -hmm. um, is is one enough? I think obviously if you have more than one, it's better. Simply because if you have one, it fails. Uh, you have a backup. I believe that if you have one and in your sleeping areas, uh, certainly that's uh, acceptable. Now, again, I would I would go with uh, the manufacturer's recommendation on how these uh, are placed. But placement regarding placement, yes, because most houses in in Athens City and in the rental areas are older houses where the sleeping is upstairs. Right. Um, but a carbon monoxide buildup would often begin in the lower level. I think the way I look at it is if you're going to see this, especially from your heating units, that it's going to be circulating. And it's going to, you know, hot air rises and it's, right. it's, it's going to, and I think it will move it towards the sleep. And I, for me, it's more important that I have one by my sleeping area. Uh, Number one, if it goes off, I'm going to hear it, uh, what's important. And if it's in the basement, I might not hear it. So, so if we were writing an ordinance for a recommendation or a requirement, then uh, one in the sleeping, at the sleeping level would be um, judged. I would, be, I would be comfortable with that. And certainly uh, I would have no problem talking with Dr. Ryan and seeing what Tim uh, thinks about it. Uh, I mean, here's a, obviously an individual uh, who I would say is probably pretty close to an expert now with as much time as he spent doing this. And uh, we have him in our, in our midst, and I would certainly uh, take advantage of that. But again, as you say, that means there's 65% of them under the worst conditions that are, are going to be working. So. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I guess first, thanks for your work this weekend and that of your firefighting teams. Oh, I just always enjoy hanging out with our student population and spending quality time with them. Good to hear. Um, well, your, your guys did a great job, so thanks. I'll pass um, that along. With regards to the carbon monoxide detectors, what's the reason that um, you don't prefer lithium batteries as a, as a backup? We've had a real issue with lithium battery smoke detectors. You know, that was supposed to be the latest and greatest in 10 years. And what we're seeing now that we're responding several times a year to lithium detectors that have been in place for two, three, four years. And they start uh, 
losing their battery power and start beeping and people get aggravated with them, pull them from their ceilings, throw them into a dumpster and some good Samaritan is going by and goes, oh my God, the dumpster's beeping. And we'll get called and we'll have to send a truck and a crew and ties our people up <laughs> and we get there and find that we have a lithium battery detector. So it has been problematic for us. I think it will continue to be problematic. Uh, lithium batteries or lithium detectors are basically throwaway detectors. Uh, once you lock that battery in, it's it's locked in. You, that's the way it is. So I'm not I'm not overly thrilled with the lithium battery ordinance. Uh, the national national program that, that's been in place for many years uh, through NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, is chain your batteries when you change your clocks. Try that with a lithium detector. And think about how many calls we get that, well, how do you change this battery? We're supposed to change them when we change our clocks. So it, that ordinance has, in my opinion, some flaws in it that somehow in the future we ought to address. So that's the long answer to to the question on uh, carbon monoxide detectors. I would stay away from the lithium batteries. Member Bain? Um, I wanted to um, actually speak with my experience with both a hardwired and a, a lithium battery smoke detector because of the numbers involved. And I had had a hardwired for many, many years. But the new ones also have a 15 volt requirement on the hard wire. And they are also only, according to my electrician, 10 year, 10 year detectors. So, um, you know, back in the day, 30 years ago when my kids were little, I had one that lasted for 30 years. It was very annoying before I could get it down and out once it went, but it was good. The new ones are, do require a 15 volt battery, as do the lithium. You know, so if people think they can put those in and forget them for 10 years, not clean them, they've got a problem. We've got a bigger problem than throwing it in the trash and having a beeping dumpster. Well, I, mean, I can't believe they're that stupid. We, I think you have to, to understand the percentage of individuals that we have to deal with are not owner-occupied individuals. And we find that owner-occupied individuals tend to be a little more conscientious. I'm talking about my, I have a, I, have a, I own the house next door, and I'm saying that I, as a main ta maintenance thing, I have to change those 15-volt batteries in the lithium yeah. every year. I mean, so it's not an, a mystery to anybody who's done this, anybody who's old enough to have done it. And it's probably a landlord function rather than a... Uh, individual function. So I don't really buy that there's a, I mean, I think the, that you can argue, and I will argue, I mean, I would say it's probably a good idea, but my one comment is that we, you know, that we would have a consistent basis and hardwire might be good. I don't know if it would work, but right now the one thing I think we have to do is make absolutely clear that if we're going to adopt a specific requirement that there are enough of them in town, because in about three years, we're going to have another round of lithium, aren't we? Lithium battery detectors, because you know it's like a normal curve, and the failure rate. There are going to be some that'll last for 15 years, but some will fail at five years, as you mentioned. And you know, it's just it's going to be that way. It's just the laws of, of probability. And I think some have already failed. You mentioned those, but some will go longer, and that's going to be the real task. And but just going back to the um, carbon monoxide detector, I don't think any of our local purveyors can provide them in very short order. I think we need to have some kind of, you know, timeline for implementation. Bottom line, that's because there was a problem with the smoke detectors. On, on the I can't, yeah, I can't, end. You know, I can't answer how quickly someone like uh, Mr. Cody could out, you know, out I wasn't his, thinking of him. But, I mean, you know, I don't know. Anybody. But I would, I would certainly think uh, within a year, we ought, I mean, anybody who has a unit I think within a year certainly ought to be able to get the required units. Okay. Uh, and if you if you adopt this ordinance, give them a year to have, have them outfitted. Yeah, I think that's our experience from before. And I do have them in my rental and in my own house. So. So. I'm for it. I'm for it. I just don't want chaos again. 
Well, we would, we would prefer not to have that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you have that. I mean, but you, you know, you're part of the ticking the sign bomb and the surface safety director. I just wanted to weigh in that if it's such that uh, if they're that common with a lithium battery, code is now doing annual inspections. That could be an annual item to note that have to be replaced. And they could, you can even make it one of those reinspection requirements as it were. And one of the problems we have is you can't replace them on a lot of the detectors. Once you buy the detector and you activate it, and it's activated by a little, some of them are activated by little twist locks that break off. And that detector is activated and there is no way to, to change the battery. That's the issue that we're finding is these detectors that, are, that have been bought uh, with these type of batteries that cannot be replaced. It's basically a throwaway unit. Once that unit uh, loses its battery power, you just take it off the lawn and then that's thrown away, hopefully disabling it first so we don't get called. But that's that's the issue. I mean, Nancy said that you're able to replace your... Not the lithium, but there's a backup battery that is a 15 right. volt, and it chirps. I guess that's what they're yeah. referring to, the 15 Yeah, and I, and I wasn't so, talking about the lithium thing, because right. I don't even know what mine is. In the, yeah. But I mean, the lithiums are a real headaches for us. Well, I think I mean, the, the landfill the, the, thing... The pure lithium. That's true. Think about throwing all that stuff in the landfill. 5,000 batteries in three years. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully so, we'll have biannual household hazardous waste pickups. Oh, well, that's good. We can get buckets. <laughs> but, but NFPA... I mean, this is a very old and, and well-respected organization. Ought to know something. And if they're still running their programs with change your batteries, when you change your clocks, I mean, that, that ought to tell you something. That you know, they, they still believe in uh, checking their detectors twice a year, basically, and in those batteries. I feel they believe that. Uh, is a safer way to go. And again, I just re reiterate that we're not a normal community. We have you know, a high percentage of rental units. And statistics show that rental-owned properties have more incidents of fires, have more incidents, I'm sure, of not checking their safety systems within their houses, and that's a fact. So um, I think we need to do whatever we can do when we, we pass legislation to make these as fail-safe as we can. And I know that was how we, we ended up with the lithium battery, because they, they couldn't be removed. And I think we've had that on the books long enough now to realize that probably in retrospect it was not such a good idea. When we first looked at it, it was probably okay. It sounded good. But now we see that we have some issues with it. But I still like AC battery backup. I think that you, you have battery and you have AC. If one fails, you have the battery backup. So. Amber Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I had a quick question. You mentioned natural gas and the old uh, oil um, heated homes. What, what about um, homes that are heated with, uh, with with wood or wood stoves? Sure. Do you recommend anything that, is... that, that you have combustion that has okay. the ability to produce carbon monoxide? Okay. And, uh, and I will say it is it is CO. Uh, it, as the messenger indicated, it is not CO2. Uh, very different gases. But uh, anytime you have anything that uh, it's basically combustible. It will produce uh, carbon monoxide. What we get away from that is uh, with the all-electric homes. And, and I would caution even even with that is still, if, I don't know if you remember several years ago, we had a, we had a fire, I believe it was on Terrace, uh, where a, a lady perished. And basically she had driven her car into the attached garage, uh, was unloading groceries, got distracted and went in and sat down with the car still running. Mm -hmm. Well, it eventually caught the, the house on fire because of the, the heat of the catalytic converter, but uh, more importantly, it introduced a tremendous amount of carbon monoxide throughout the house, and ultimately she did perish. 
not unruly not from the fire because we were able to extricate her uh, fairly quickly once we arrived. So those are issues with attached garages. And as, if you write legislation, I would certainly encourage you to write, uh, even though it is an all-electric house, it has an attached garage, there's, it's still problematic and can, can be an issue. Thank you. Um, so you recommend digital beat plus you're saying if you go and look at the numbers. Uh, most of these detectives have a, like a high point set point where they say it has shown so much or is it just so you can Depend go in and read it? It depends on the detector. You know, obviously it's nice to have the ones that you can push the button and it will go back and show you the high point on parts per million. Mm -hmm. A lot of detectors will simply show you what's going on the arrival or real time what's actually occurring. Okay. The, as I said, the issue with that is once our guys arrive, the individuals may have opened doors, windows, and consequently been at the house. Mm -hmm. and we don't see uh, what's going on. Exactly what's going on. Okay. Generally, the guys can pick it up with our meters, but we still like to leave the tube if we don't see anything because it's, it's a backup. Mm -hmm. We believe that uh, just a little safety for us and the residents. Okay. Thank you, Chief Troxell. Sure. Mr. McMillan, would you come forward? Sure. You could come up here or there. At the podium or sit here, your choice. Sorry, that's a matter. I'll sit right here. And okay. Just state your name and address. So, beg your pardon? And if you could just state your name and address. Name and okay. address for the record. All right. I'm Alan McMillan. Oh, you don't have to say that. Okay. Not okay. <laughs> I'm Alan McMillan, and I uh, live at 209 East State Street. In Thank Athens. you. And I, I know that you have rental properties, and could you share some of your experiences and your views with us? Yeah, and, and I come before you not as an expert, but just as a landlord, and I think somebody that's trying to apply some common sense, uh, and also got a lot of surprises along the way. We uh, had made a significant investment in the community uh, starting three and a half years ago. I don't know if I have these numbers exactly right, but they're in the ballpark. You know, we. Uh, we have uh, about 48 apartments. They're housed within about 20 properties, uh, and we have over 100 students now. And we've got more on the way. You know, we just, you know, uh, are constantly investing. Um, we uh, we had an incident uh, that I think it was in the uh, January time frame. The students came back and. A carbon uh, a CO detector went off, and we went at first. We weren't sure, you know, was it a battery or something because it was battery operated. So we changed the battery. It seemed to solve the problem. And then over the weekend, uh, the residents tried to call us, and there was a snafu with the phone switch that we use, and so they didn't get a quick response from us, which is pretty abnormal. But that was the case on that day. And they called the fire department, which was absolutely the right thing to do. And when they came in, I guess they had a meter with them, and they found out the the levels were 70 parts per million. Okay, which um, they immediately vacated the the structure and uh, said, "You got to get out." And by the way, if you had slept through this, there was potential you could have not woken up. Um, so I got to tell you that it, it was like my life passed in front of me, and not like about litigation or anything like that, but certainly that would be a, an issue. But it wasn't that. It was like I'm a father, too, and, you know, and we're trying to provide a quality product, and we're working real hard at this. And I think we've got an early reputation that we have poured a significant amount of money into the rentals that we bought, and, uh, and the number one concern is safety. So all of a sudden, I was sitting there going, well, first, thank God there was a CO detector. And, you know, and, and I wouldn't even want to think what would happen if it didn't. So then, since I didn't have any experience in this, we started to ask some questions about what do we do. Now, I was shocked because there was a Nina meeting, and Nina happened to have uh, uh, Co-Director Patsky uh, came and, uh, and Chief Mayor and Chief Troxel. So I thanked the chief for, you know, making the call because it was within the week or two of that meeting. And he said, you're going to be shocked at this. There's not a uh, requirement 
And, you know, hearing that, I thought after we just had something, I got to tell you, I was shaken to my core. And the notion that we don't have that as a requirement was nearly as shocking. Okay, so then we called the, uh, we were trying to say, okay, what do we do going forward? And we called down to, um, is it, let me see, it's uh, a CODA or a CO. DA, the, there's a organization right up across from uh, Coed. 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 Yes. Coed. And I think there's a guy named, and they had others checking, but I got the summary, uh, Mr. Leatherman there. And he had a lot of knowledge in this area, and he asked us to contact this guy named George Kerr because he saw how concerned we were. Because what I thought if this happened once, okay, now we've got to create a process and a standard for all of our properties. And whether it's a part of code or not, uh, whatever decisions you make, I would. I think when you hear the rest of this, you're going to you got a pretty easy call here. And then when I talked to Mr. Kerr, it even got more shocking to me because I think Chief Troxell doesn't send his men into a building if it's more than 35 parts per million without uh, protection. And here these kids were sitting in 70 parts per million. You know, now if that's the case, and again, I'm not an expert on this. Um, at 70 parts per million, um, now there's the, the, these, this is the one that, you know, you get down at Lowe's, and by the way, we have all these in our property because they're UL protected, or, you know, UL recommended. So those are in every single property that we have, other than the ones that are totally electric, okay? Um, so, so when we talk to Mr. Kerr, he manufactures one. Now, I, I don't know, I just gave one to Chief Troxell, and I offered to give one to Mr. Ryan, and they're full of detectors now, and they said we'd come up on rotation. But this goes off at seven parts per million. And then, it, and then you hit the silent switch, and as long as it doesn't go over seven, it's cool. And then it goes off again at 25 parts per million, 35 parts per million, and it goes up to 50 parts per million, and it goes up to 70 parts per million, and it goes off again at 100 parts per million. So the other thing, too, is um, that CO, if I have this right, this is from what I've learned, rises like smoke rises. So the notion that these, and I absolutely think these are part of the mix, okay, the ones that plug in, but where's your plug? It's down here. Now, this is, even if it's only... Two-thirds of the time they work, which I think if you have new ones and you have some, they only can be so old, you can probably remedy that problem. But still, they're lower, and so if CO rises, we want it to be up the top. This mounts six inches below the ceiling and is battery operated because there's no plug up there. Okay, so what we did was, and I said to Mr. Kerr that manufactured these, and he has a vested interest, I guess, and these are more expensive. These, I think this is around uh, 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. And this is around just under sixty dollars. Okay, and uh, and what we did was he said he would put them close to every sleeping area. So so you got to be careful because some of these old homes, and we've got a cross sample. You'll have a sleeping area upstairs on one staircase and a sleeping area on another staircase. So anywhere you buy a sleeping area, we'll put one. We'll put one down on the living level, and we'll also put one in the basement if that's where the equipment is. And we're gonna we're gonna go to that. Now, this is not UL protected or UL listed. And the reason for that is what Mr. Kerr says is there are big companies that spend big money for UL protection. And funny me should be knocking big companies, and if you know my background in capitalism. But anyway, you know, everyone's influenced, right? And so, so we thought the best thing for us to do is do both. And it was because we were so shook, shook up about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, if somebody had died in one of our places, I, 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 I just, you know, and, and apparently that could have happened. And also, you got to understand, too, and we have a good cross-section of this, buying nearly 50 apartments, we're a pretty good leading indicator of what the condition of the market's like. And there are some really well-maintained properties. There's a lot of new properties on the market, a lot of full remodels now that are beautiful. But the majority of properties out there, we have found to be tired. 
<laughs> and and uh, oh, this nice is what the hotels say when the when the drapes are a little old, okay? And they and they uh, <laughs> and they and they have what they call deferred maintenance, where you put the maintenance <laughs> off for a while. And so, so we've stepped up. We 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 bought units that uh, we got an affidavit that the heating system was right, and we weren't convinced that it didn't have problems and it was repaired for CO. So we ripped it out immediately and put new systems in. So, you know, and, and, and I guess we're in a position to do that. But, but we, we, we take this real seriously and I don't think I'm over the top by putting both of them in because this is UL protected, it's plugged in. This is another one, I don't, I don't know what to do so I'm doing them both. And uh, I'd also, maybe in another day, so I can keep the remarks brief, is that I got a handout I can give you that, that, that has Mr. Kerr's you know, feelings on all this. And, uh, and, and I think if you couple that with the condition of many rentals, um, I mean, I could frighten you with some of the things that we found you know, after purchase. Now, when we did it, we got it inspected at the time of purchase. I think if you ask the code office, whenever we get inspected, we, we walk out with a longer list than they're given us. And internally, we're disappointed if the code office could come up with anything. We think the code office, by the way, is great. It's probably bad for the code office reputation when a landlord says they're great. But we think it's like a free inspection. It's a value add to us. And all they want to do is make the place nicer and safer. And they're really helpful as far as uh, doing that. And so what, so, but, but, but then all of a sudden here I'm sitting with this problem after I had it professionally inspected within two years of this, no, within three years of that incident by building inspectors. Then I've had a code inspection every year and I still ended up with the problem. So, and then you have to factor in the condition of the rentals and, and one other thing. We find these, uh, not these yet, I'm sure they're destined for the same fate, but we find the smoke detectors in all of the unlikely places. Backyard, stairwells, thrown away, you know, often. And uh, what we're told is uh, we were cooking. Okay, so, so you were cooking, okay. So what we're doing is we're now starting to pattern in micro hoods over the cooking surfaces to make sure that we can vent the cooking. I suspect there's other reasons why these things can go off, you know, and, uh, and but what we, we are preaching, but it's hard to do it, it's an, it's an evictable offense, but it's, it's hard, you know, um, to do that. But we, we also tell our customers, which are students, that if they have a problem with our heavy handedness with this, just call their parents and ask them if they have a problem. <laughs> So, so we did that. One other thing, so we thought we were starting to do the right thing, so it was March, April, and it was over on another property, and it was this time a water detector. CO device went off, warning device, we went in, and then we found out that if it was vented today, it was not up to code. But you know, your challenge is, the code keeps getting more stringent over time with lessons learned, but whatever you put in the past, and there's nothing I don't think you're, in a practical way you can do now, there's going to be things that are vented in a manner today or neglected um, that could cause a problem. So to have the detectors, I think, is a starting point. I don't know if you want to go, I don't, it, I, it's difficult at night, and you know, I think if you got Mr. Ryan to help you, Dr. Ryan, to, to do that with, with uh, Chief Troxell, I, I think that's a good place to start, but we're, we're doing this. And these are on back order, we've got 12, we've got 50 on order. And, uh, and some of our places are electric, so we don't need them. But this is gonna be standard operating procedure for us. Um, Great. I think that that's... That's it. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Mr. McMillan? Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so thank you. much. And um, so do you all agree that we're ready to go forward? Do we have enough information to go forward? Okay. Great. Right. Okay. Good okay. okay. stuff. Okay. 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 Okay.
Well, thanks again to the both of you, Mr. McMillan and Chief Troxell. Um, should I go ahead with my um, fire department roof? Okay. The fire department roof will be under the safety committee tonight. It, it was a toss-up between finance or, or safety. Did you need to say something? I had some miscellaneous. Okay. Okay. She Let's do your miscellaneous first then. Okay. She, has she has one for the roof. She's going to do the fire roof. And under finance. Oh, I thought you're doing it under Her, safety. She's doing I, it I'm doing years. roof under safety now, if that's yeah. okay, okay with you. Right. And then. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I could barely hear you. I'm sorry, sure. I'll try to speak louder. Okay. Into the mic. Okay. Uh, fire Station 2 on Richland Avenue developed some leaks during our last major rain event. And. Um, I've been told that it would cost approximately $7,725 to patch up the old roof, which is over 10 years old and is not under warranty. And um, it would cost uh, a total of uh, approximately $23,000 to replace that roof, which would have, I believe, a 10-year warranty. Is that correct, Chief Troxell? I believe so. I okay. talked to Jordan about that. That's normal. Okay. Um, so it just sort of makes sense to me that we would replace the roof instead of spending almost $8,000 patching up the old one. That probably wouldn't last very long. This money would come out of um, capital improvements. And... Um, we would appropriate $23,000 to 101.208 transaction class 500. Do you need to add something? Chief, did you have anything to add on that one? They can't hear you. The only thing I would, would indicate is you know, this is an ongoing issue that we have with flat roofs. Uh, we know that they're warranted for 10 years, and that's about what we get out of them. So just be aware that uh, you need to think of that in a 10-year uh, replacement cycle for these stations that have flat roofs. Uh, certainly my recommendation of you if you ever decide to build another station, for God's sakes, don't pull a flat roof on it. Uh, I mean, they're, they're just a constant issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. What? Did you have something? Um, two quick miscellaneous, just to make everyone aware. If you drove in this way, you already saw this. Um, the light pole was, uh, the light structure Traffic was light. taken out at Carpenter and Court by a tractor trailer today. They have managed to um, get it down and out of the way. We're working towards getting a new one ordered and in. We were able, I believe, to save the light fixtures. It is a three-way stop. The stop signs are out, so everybody's just got to be careful for the next few days. Until that's why the street was closed that's, this evening. That's exactly why the street was closed earlier. So now it's open and flowing with a three-way stop, and always, of course, stop for emergency vehicles. And I guess uh, uh, under safety services, I wanted to talk about Palmer Fest. You've seen it. If you haven't seen it, I'm sure you've seen the front cover of the newspapers. Um, it was bad. It was worse than bad. We felt like we had a lot of effort in pre-planning, and uh, we still had the streets, you know, fires in the streets. So we have a message going out this weekend, and it will be ongoing. It is clear, and it will be made clear, you can take any street and put fest after it. If you, this body, council, has not authorized any street closing, they, it is not legal, as it were. Um, it's non-sanctioned, I guess. Is, they can call it what they like, but they do not have, when you have these parties, they have no right to impede public rights of ways, whether it be your sidewalks or whether it be your streets. That will be strictly enforced this weekend, as it were. Um, we met with uh, High University President McDavis. He had his uh, Vice President uh, Smith there, Dean Lombardi, city police, OUPD, and neighborhood executives with a clear message that will be going out that violations of any of the city laws will not be tolerated this weekend. 
The costs exceeded over 26000 between the high. Uh, that does not include Ohio University's overtime costs, but from our internal city um, police, uh, city fire, and support services. That was for one weekend, and we're facing another one. Um, media le releases went out today, both from the uh, city of Athens and Ohio University, outlining um, the offenses and the fact that we will be looking at these very carefully and enforcing the laws. And we're also working on another one that should be released tomorrow and be distributed to the pre-planning meetings that we'll have tomorrow night. Sure. Yes. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody who worked overtime this weekend. It's exceedingly difficult, I know. Um, I also like to point out that it's not like the city and the university and the residents of these streets have not discussed things beforehand. There were several pre-planning meetings. Um, there is community police dialogues. There are town hall meetings. Um, there were, um, you know, neighborhood picnics. It's several people's, you know, um, comments and such was that there's not enough dialogue. But it seemed that the police yeah. and the fire and the city and the university and and many of the residents they had pre-planning meetings. Police went door to door, so there is dialogue going on. And I'm just I'm disappointed that there are few students out there um, and few people who decide that. that they need to do this sort of thing, and I and I just I don't accept the fact that that people say there's not enough dialogue, because there is dialogue. Sometimes maybe we're preaching to the choir, but students need to take responsibility too. Member Nicely. No, I just agree with Council Member Fall, and um, also express some regret that you know our safety service people, police and firemen, were put in danger. And uh, I noticed the, uh, the president did make a comment today, the president of the yeah. university, saying that he doesn't want to see the university or city employees at risk. I'd add to your comments, Chris, that not only has there been dialogue with all those other groups and amongst citizens and at town hall meetings in various venues, but off-campus housing, um, Director Barb Harrison has made repeated efforts to go out into the community and has also been joined by um, the President's Office and the Student Services Office, I believe Kent Smith, and um, landlords went out to talk to their tenants um, last week about this. So, um, yeah, I just think we need to, I would say that not just on fest weekends, but any weekend, that this, you know, is just, it's the standard that we need to set in our community um, for not tolerating, you know, streets being taken over. Really? Yes. And, and along with that, um, there, there is a bit of dialogue in preparation for this with the university and the city um, and the students as well as uh, permanent residents. And I think that this paying off, it doesn't, you don't see it because it doesn't change the end outcome. But um, I went down to observe Palmer Fest, watched it with Ron Lucas for a little bit. Um, there weren't people on the roofs, so that was a clear, I think, safety um, improvement over over previous um, incidents. Um, I saw people putting out small fires that the that, that small number of troublemakers um, were started. So I think it would be my guess that the people that live there and a good proportion of the students are listening and, and responding in a, in a positive way. Um, it doesn't solve the problem, of course, because you have large crowds where, who knows, maybe two-thirds of the people aren't even from Athens or students here. And it, it really is, is difficult and sad to see. But um, again, as was said, thanks to the city police and firefighters and the administration for handling this the best way they could. It's a sad situation when a few students ruin it for everybody. Anything else? That's all for the safety committee then. Okay, uh, there's been some mention of finance and personnel, so we'll move into that committee meeting. Um, and I believe Member uh, Kuhn is going to continue 
speaking here. We've got some appropriations. Okay. Uh, we spoke about one appropriation that would be for the fire department roof, uh, fire, fire station roof on Richland Avenue. Um, and then should I mention the air conditioner? Yes. Okay. Um, the code office has two air conditioners and one has failed. And so we do need to appropriate, I believe it's $3,000 to replace that failed air conditioner. Exactly. Auditor? Sorry. Oh, actually, um, that money has already started moving through. Okay. There was money um, in lands and buildings. So we don't need an appropriation for that. Right, we don't need an appropriation for that, for that one. Okay. Well, Sorry. we do need appropriation for the other one, right? For the server room, yeah, but she yeah. was talking about oh, okay. code. She's got a list. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The one for code, the 3000 we did find the money. You found the money for so that. So that does okay. not need an appropriation. Good, okay. That was just decided today. Sorry. Okay. I think to tell you. I'm not, I wasn't getting emails anyway, so I wouldn't. True, <laughs> neither were we. Oh, <laughs> it's it's not in. It's not a, that's what I heard. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, Member Sand, should I mention uh, replacement of the parking enforcement officer? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a parking enforcement person is retiring, and so, um, and there will of course be a payout, and so we need to replace that person and would like to do a, have that person on board in September so that we can do the payout and then start paying a new person after after we do that. So I believe that process is starting to hire a new person. It'll Since it is a union position, it'll be posted internally to see if they're, and then that will determine a time frame in terms of advertising. And I didn't bring the statistics, but parking enforcement officers uh, essentially fund their own position and then some. So. And with okay. some are being slow, we figure we try to bring them on with a high time. Okay, that's good to hear. They fund their own position. Okay. Um, should I mention anything else? What else is on there? There's the armory roof. Yeah. It says, uh, pro I'm sorry, I'm not really fam too familiar with the armory roof. Did you talk about that after I left last Thursday? Uh, it was le it's leaking. It's uh, leaking. Again, I think the rain. Last weekend, weekend before, I tested a lot of roofs mm -hmm. from the fire stations to the armory. Um, it had some leaks in it, so um, and we're trying to get that replaced. So you're about two thousand dollars, I think. It says that we need to appropriate two thousand dollars to five eighty two point five eight zero TC three hundred mm -hmm. for the armory roof. Is that a flat roof as well? It, actually, parts of it are flat. Some of the parts aren't, but the majority is flat. Okay. Okay. Um, and speaking of um, the it. server room and the air conditioner being cool, um, we have a small control room over here which um, holds a tremendous amount of heat from, from the equipment that is matched there. And um, the, the system that has been installed in the server room downstairs uh, adjacent to the service safety director's um, office uh, is working exceedingly well. The equipment is working, the equipment that is um, operating in there operates well um, and um, people need to wear some sweaters to work in there but it's, that goes with the job. Um, we've had some problems here. You, you, you noticed um, at times that our live feed doesn't always go out. Um, that's because the heat in this room is, is causing some problems with our equipment. And so um, we're asking uh, to um, appropriate some money, um, and I don't see a... 7000 7000 about $7,000 to um, install the same kind of cooling system um, in this room that is downstairs. And um, council members, if you like to view that and experience it, uh, please do in the next week. Um, it, it, again, it's adjacent to um, the service safety director's office, and um, that's where our all of our mainframes that 
are back up working now, I understand, uh, where they're installed. Auditor, did you have a... Just wanted to add that that money will come out of the cable access fund? Yes. I think you should have them experience it back here for the 85 degrees and then come downstairs <laughs> for the 65. I, that's a good thing. Walk through here. And, and just at, by the end of this, seriously, by the end of this uh, meeting, walk through this little area, see how hot it is. Um, and um, remember that this is electronic equipment, which is uh, fairly sensitive to, to heat. Um, and then then you can notice how, how well things are working downstairs. So $7,000 there. And then while we're talking about cable access, um, one of the machines here, uh, the live switching recording computer, um, needs to be updated. It's at the end of its three-year life cycle. Um, and um, the government channel would um, like to update that and um, would their preferred uh, replacement would be high definition compatible. Um, again, this is the this is the unit that has been causing a lot of our problems. Um, so it needs to be replaced at the end of its three year cycle, approximately fifteen thousand dollars again from the cable access fund, which if you look at your fund balance has um, relatively he healthy, unappropriated balance. Okay. Um, and are we still, do we need to talk about the bus purchase, buses, or are we ready to do that yet? You want to do what? Can we do the Mansfield House first? Sure. It's still, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get a hard and fast number. Right now in our notes, we have appropriation of, of approximately $10,000 to do that repair. It may change by the time it comes to you in a form of a appropriation ordinance next Monday. Is that, is that fair? Sure. Uh, okay. Mansfield House, uh, remember this is where the um, Convention and Visitors Bureau is housed. Um, the Mansfield House belongs to the city. They, they rent it from us for a fairly nominal rent. Um, but it is up to us to maintain it. And one of the beams in, in the second floor floor has um, weakened and needs to be replaced. And um, would, are we looking at having someone come in or are we looking at doing that in-house? Um, no, because I'm essentially doing an emergency based on how we came out of that, it would, um, there is a, Expert in law cabinets who's supposed to be providing an estimate for us. So. Okay. The conversation is whether we shim it, uh, try to do a period piece, or replace the entire beam itself, and try again try to keep it uh, historically accurate. Uh, as it stands now, the, nobody can use that room. The recommendation that the uh, the live load on it was to just putting the desk there and everything there was not proper, so we've emptied the room out and it's empty right now. I told you you can jump up and down and feel it spring, but you don't want to really do that. Just take their word for it. Yeah. Don't don't visit the Mansfield House and, and test that out. Just go down and look at the server. Okay. Um, and what else? Do we, um, buses. Buses. Getting rid of buses. We've got yes. Um, Getting rid of buses. Uh, and acquiring buses. And acquiring buses. Yes. Yeah, um, any. Do you want me to go yes, into that? Mayor. Okay. Um, last Thursday, of course, the, I met with uh, several of you, finance committee members. Um, I could start with the acquiring buses. Essentially, this is the intercity bus system. Um, there's stimulus money to, um, to buy three buses for our bus system, the Cincinnati to Athens and Athens to Columbus routes. Um, it is a reimbursement. Um, I believe we were talking about maybe $472,000 per bus. Uh, we get reimbursed for it, but it still means we have to put the money forward to cut the PO. We're talking about tying up some money for about four months to six months. Uh, I had a conversation with, uh, I think we were talking with Ray Thursday and Kathy earlier. Um, the best recommendation right now is that we would actually purchase the buses and lease it out to the bus company that will service our city. Uh, it means tying up about almost a million and a half dollars for about uh, six months. Uh, doing the math, um, and we thank Nancy for that. We talk about maybe about 15,000 in terms of interest. 
Um, as it stands now, we could probably get that back in terms of the leasing because we lease it at, at a given price. But um, what we need to do is authorize at least uh, putting a note out, I believe, is that how to put the term out, for the duration to purchase these buses. Um, this is, um, as I say, stimulus money that's uh, already committed to buses for this system. Um, so I need the authoriz authorization of that and get that moving as fast as possible. We, if you remember, we've extended the contract with Lakefront to July 31st, so that's the time limit we have to actually get this rolling. Uh, the contracts, I don't think we'll get the buses before then, but we should get them as soon as possible. Does that answer your questions, other questions? Does, no? And we could, we could give the old um, um, promotion here and say, um, what does this give Athens? It gives us connectivity up to almost what it was in 1980. Yes. So we lost almost all of that in the inter intervening period, and now through this grant, we're getting it back, mm -hmm. and that's important. And we will have virtually, we will have some return on this money. Hawking will be served, Ohio University will be served, the Amish community will be served, and other people that want to go to the airport will be served. So it's very important. And we will have probably zero impact on our budget when it's all done. Yes. It's, but it's very important for connectivity to be connected with that outside world. This program, part of the, the, the program actually puts us in sync with the Greyhound bus system, which services Columbus and Cincinnati. So yes. once you get there, you can connect with the rest of the country. Uh, and again, it just, it just adds us to the rest of the world as much as possible. And we used to have Greyhound here. When was it? We 80s, did. right? 1980. Okay. Beginning of the end. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, the, if you remember, we're going to have uh, HAPCAP, Hocking Athens Prairie Community Action, doing the grant uh, administration of this. So we'll tie up our services in that sense. Okay. Okay, yes. Okay, I, I just reminded also bus disposal. Yes. Um, we have, um, I had a chance conversation with our uh, manager of transit, Athens Transit. We have those two buses from University Courtyard. One has a broken engine, one has a broken transmission. These are Gilligs from, I think, 1991, 1993. We're no, no longer servicing University Courtyard, so we want to get rid of those buses. They need to be um, vacated, abandoned, or in, by council, I assume, has to be done, done because they're probably over $1,000. Uh, there is a 1999 Dodge Turtle Top van. I think we abandoned that already than last time. We just haven't gotten rid of it. Um, we are actually ahead in terms of what they call the cutaways. These are the buses, transit buses we use right now. We got one last, we got two last year, one through capital, our capital program to replace the bus. We also got an extra one for our stimulus package money. Um, we actually have one in our budget for this year coming up as well. It's usually 90% paid off. We're talking about a, approximately $60,000 bus to what we get for 6000 this will put us with an excess of buses. We'll have a 2002 and 2003 Ford cutaway. That's what those are called out there, light transit buses. Um, we feel that possibly we should uh, get rid of those uh, since we'll have probably more buses than we have room. Um, the other, so really I'm thinking in terms for, for council is, again, is to uh, relinquish, to say we have no further need of this. But one of the other conversations I've been having is that it's possible you might want to think about handing these down to other nonprofits. We have a, a mobility coordinator in the county now, um, which gives us the ability actually to say, okay, is there somebody who has a need, a nonprofit out there, an organization that needs bus uh, capability? These buses aren't, as a 2002-2003 diesel, they should be fairly good. Um, they're probably at the back end of their lifespan, but it might give an opportunity for somebody to use a service. And that's what I'd like to put into the blend of whatever uh, ordinance you put forward to relinquish these. I think we've got a nibble on that Dodge van too, but I think somebody wants to look at it first. But that's, that's already been done. So again, the idea is to have a hand-me-down service, so to speak. Uh, and I think at staff, we also had a conversation about police cars, too. Do you want to bring that up? Or? Um, that when the, you authorize a new police cruiser this year, when that all plays out and it comes in and then the captain's car gets changed out or what have you, uh, Oak Blennis Hospital has requested, they felt if they had a, a police vehicle, they could transport their um, client, the clients 
that require transport to the psychiatric behavioral hospital. Right now they have to call APD for a transport. Um, so that may be a future disposal donation request. But that is future. That's not this tied year. to this. So. This yeah. year, but yeah. Not that yeah. And, and as, as well as um, nonprofits, we were also speaking about the possibility of other governmental agencies, smaller cities, um, some that would have a demonstrated use for for one of these buses. Yes. Uh, would, this option could put us in the you know in the position of being able to. Uh, share our good luck that we've that we've had uh, with this bus system, with with some others, people, some other organizations. And, and and tell you the truth, every once in a while I'm in a conversation with other uh, mayors in other counties, and I'm talking about the, this area. And I always forget that this is actually one of the largest cities, uh, and we have resources that some cities. Uh, just wish they had, um, much less buses or, or, or something. As, 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 as little as we have, we have more than some of the villages out there. And, um, and the fact is that we had the windfall of the, of the stimulus bus last year, as, as I said, put us ahead a little bit. Um, and again, it's, it's to be determined whether we'll find somebody who has, actually has interest, but I want that option if possible. I think that's all we Any have. Questions or discussions about that particular option? Disposal of the buses? Okay. You lot who says. Okay. So, sure. <laughs> um, that takes care of the notes that I have. Um, any uh, I don't mayor, have auditor, anything to add? Uh, Going to wait on the street rehab levy renewal? It's under transport. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's out there, just not here. Okay. Further down the Okay. Um, and so that takes care of any miscellaneous that we have. We'll move on to the Transportation Committee. And auditor, here you go. Okay. Street rehab Thank you. Um, I, I thought I would maybe just introduce the topic and then defer to you if you have some additional information. Uh, we have a suggestion, and this comes from the Director of Public Works, and this concerns the um, income tax and the renewal of the street rehab levy. The current um, amount that we have is 0.1% for street rehabilitation. That is current and will be through December 2011. The suggestion is, because we do have a large number of projects coming up for improvements to our streets, Richland Avenue South project, the Columbus Road, the Oxbow Bridge, numerous other projects coming up in the next few years. Um, so a suggestion has been made to consider the possibility of beginning a 0.1% um, um, additional amount. Um, on the income tax that would be placed on the fall ballot. It would be 0.1% for street rehab and 0.02% for multimodal projects. So that would make a total of 0.12 um, to be effective this fall. Um, for the modal, multimodal, um, what we had in mind was that uh, things like the street, or excuse me, the sidewalk repairs that are coming up. We currently have a city-wide inventory and criteria system for establishing um, consistent kind of sidewalk repair. The estimates for that, that project to begin would um, be about $50,000 a year that we could need for that project. Some of that will recoup through assessments, but that happens later on after the fact. So the city has to come up with that money to begin those uh, sidewalk repairs. So I thought I would bring this up for comments and discussion amongst council members tonight and also comments. Um, also, yes, the multimodal would allow for the bicycle um, and pedestrian improvements, part of which we've started the first steps for setting the goals for that for short, medium, and long term um, through our bicycle and pedestrian plan. Council Member Bain. Yes, Chris, and the reason why we started thinking about this is because we have the culvert on the bike path between um, Stimson and mm -hmm. the wastewater treatment plant, which has collapsed. And so there's money. We need to spend money on that. And then you think a bit more and say, well, we built a bike path, but there's really no maintenance stream. And so 
what we need to do is get a little bit of money together to implement the plan for um, walking and riding bikes. But we also need to have the money to do the bike path sometime soon mm -hmm. to replace the culvert. And to do, I mean, it won't probably be as much as we'd like, but it'll be a start. Mm -hmm. We won't have to take the money out of streets, mm -hmm. and that will be a more appealing alternative. And so we're bringing it up now to put it on the, to get it on the, go through the process in August if you're all willing. And then, I'm not even on the transport committee, but we would then vote in November on this, right? That's Correct. what we're going for. And it, Mayor Wild. This would be for the general ballot, um, as you say. So it's it's attack. It's to be voted on by the citizens. Um, just to, to dovetail, I know the uh, repair of the bike path right now is coming out of streets. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I think he's the guesstimate we're hearing somewhere below ten thousand, but that's still ten thousand that's going to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, the plan I think we have for the bike pedestrian plan is fairly robust. If we want to if we want to actually do a lot of those things, it will require some funds in the future. And the, and the thought is, too, that re, repaving, that would be one example. That's not even a new project, but repaving of the existing bike path. If that's out there a few years from now, mm -hmm. you know, that expense could well be towards $50,000 to repave that. Yes, Councilman Fasney. Um, do we know how much, I don't know if anyone has the numbers right now, how much that 0.02% would be roughly per year? I think she said 50, right? Well, that no, that's an estimate of the the repairs that oh, I see. could be needed. I thought it was so. between thirty and fifty. Okay. Is it in that ballpark? It's and that's the ballpark. Yeah. Um, and second question would be: SDI. Would these, would this, uh, so this point one two percent to replace the point one percent? Would that be a single um, issue on the ballot, or would we separate them out? Single. A single issue, I think. Yeah. Together. And I, I think I think it's probably worthwhile to have that have that funding available. Um, Will allow us to pave more streets, replace, you know, fill more potholes while we don't neglect these, these other aspects of transportation. And importantly, I, I think um, Director Stone has done an amazing job with leveraging the funds that he does have available um, for state and federal uh, funding for these projects. So, with, with a little bit of investment there, I think we probably see a really great return in what the city's able to do with that. Councilmember Fall. Okay, sorry. Um, what would happen to the levy that's presently now? It would just that would continue it would end. through the December 2011. So this isn't an early vote on the replacement. Yeah. It's actually an increase. It is an it's in addition to the existing for one year only. For one year only, yeah. And then the other one would and that's debatable. I mean, we could just but people would have an opportunity to vote on a renewal mm -hmm. of that one mm -hmm. in 2011. Correct. Mayor Wall. But no, let's clarify that we're not going to double up. <laughs> well, if we do double up, it'll only be for a year. And my, you know, my opinion. Correct. And my understanding was that we hadn't really made a decision. We wanted to find out what everybody was thinking, but we could double up for a year, or else not. It's kind of. You could make it 2012. How much is? How much double up, you know. I mean, we did with the. Oh, he doesn't. He's not listening anyway. Van Meter did it with the. East State Street, Gary Van Meter, and it worked. 80,000, 80 or 90. Okay. So the, the idea would be to have a one year overlap between the two. That's the current, I, one of the options. The other one would just make it 2012. January 1st. And not I think November. the preference. I think no, no, preference. we're going to vote on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think oh, the it preference start. for the Director of Public Works would be to begin it oh. mm -hmm. and to have the overlap because mm -hmm. there's just such a great need. We have so many projects mm -hmm. that need to be worked on. Mayor Wall. Um, realize you took the street tour. You know that we're doing about 200,000, 220,000, and you know as well as I that we could we could easily double that amount that we need to do. Uh, so there are lots of streets that need repair. Uh, in terms of the multimodal aspect, um, I'm aware that about probably uh, a lot of our stairways are reaching towards the back end of their lifespan. I know we replaced one off of uh, Congress and, and Columbia. I think it was due to a tree. Uh, portions of it, but I know the Fairview Grovesner one is in bad shape, and uh, I've had discussions in the past two years of having to replace that. So we do have other pedestrian walkways that need to be maintained eventually, mm -hmm. and these are, these are things that fall out of the street. They're they're not in the street fund because they're not a street; they're a, a stairway. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so just so you're aware that there are there are needs that uh, supersede actually the sidewalks at this mm -hmm. point. That's a good point. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? And so, do I have the sense of council that you would be willing for this to come forward then, in the form of an ordinance? Okay. When would it be due, Debbie? Sometime in August. Sometime in August. So, so we would need to begin the readings soon. of the ordinance soon, so that we can have this passed in time for it to be able to get on the ballot this mm -hmm. fall. It has to be ready, what, 72, 75 days before the yeah. election? Mm -hmm. So the sooner the better. Right. Okay. Any other uh, transportation items that people need to raise? Then we're finished. What's next? Oh, city services. A couple of the items, mainly informational. One of them is um, actually a question, and if we hadn't had Palmer Fest, I probably could have just called Paula and asked this question. But as you see it, or Kathy, not that she was at Palmer Fest, but um, <laughs> garbage, the garbage fund and the money from um, that's going for recycling fees, does that happen automatically, or do we have to give you authorization to send the additional amount as you see it? The extra dollar mm. starting, and we haven't started to collect I, it, but it would be nice to know that I we think have. I will be renewed. Renegotiating the contract yeah. and putting it in there. Okay. I, so I didn't realize that the full dollar will be going. To I would. The yeah, I would hope so. I mean, given the balance in the fund. Yeah, I know. That's what I wanted to know. And then, um, okay. I would have called her, but she was probably out solving problems. The second item comes from the um, comes from a meeting we have with um, Andy Stone and. We'll sing Annie's praises one more time here. Um, one of the items is that um, we have a we have a water distribution issue on the south side. On the north side, it's I wouldn't say it I won't say it's easy, but we pump it up to Highland and up to Stroud's Run, and then it just flows by gravity over the majority of the city's surface. On the south side, we have four different at least, unless I've missed one somewhere, different um, appurtenances because the south side is just the opposite of the north side. The north side has this nice big hill, commons, and it flows down from there. The south side is a valley with those upper areas, so we've got a, a reservoir or a, an appurtenance, as you could call them, on each of the um, hills. So we have Kimes and we have Blackburn, and we have Curtis and we have Long Run. And it's a problem. And I, when we first started talking about this, and Crystal um, will often talk about the problems with water being stagnant because we really are overbuilt on the south side with respect to water delivery, especially since um, uh, the LEAC system is buffering up against us right now. So um, I asked, you know, to see what's the water plan because I was resistant to deadheading a water line through open space and creating other problems. I just, you know, before I even wanted, I wanted to see the plan. Well, the plan was dated 1976, so you can imagine how, how really effective that was about this. And so after rolling my eyes a bit, um, I taught, we have a new administration, we have Andy, so I asked Andy to, um, what he could do about it. So he said, well, you know what I could do? And he, before the plan to get a bunch of engineers to come in here and do our four different reservoirs was a little $75,000, $100,000. Andy said, why don't we get somebody to come in with software and put it as an interface between the GIS program and the AutoCAD program, and then they can work on the plan. And so I'm going to ask Jim when he does the um, appropriations ordinance to add $30,000 um, to the sewer 300 category from the, um, if that's okay with the rest of you, but I just wanted you to understand what's going on. This will be a, a real, um, a working item and the um, possibilities are really substantial. I wish he could also do it with respect to um, Stormwater, but right now it's going to be a way to make a model, a map model, and do calculations, and it's much cheaper than the other, and it can grow with the system. If you if you can visualize the concept, you've got the basic plat map, and you've got the AutoCAD has it allows you to do a lot of work because they have both of those competencies. The one thing they don't have is that interface with the software. So we'll be able to maybe figure out how to avoid 
deadheading a big fat water line through a bunch of open space and creating traffic problems on Blackburn Road and instead um, manage the three, the four systems. If you're, and I'll be willing to field any question I can, but you've got about my full wrap right now. And I thought, were you there when we talked about I this? I walked in on that. My only um, surprise was that Andy wanted one more project to conduct Well, I think year, he's, I mean, what he's um, going to be doing is just saying, we want you to set it up, and then it'll be there in the future, and it won't be a paper on the shelf that they go and find. It'll be something you can use. But is this not the precursor to instituting a stormwater fee and, and you know, Could be, which is my next item. Okay, yeah. right. But the 30000 is definitely going in the water fund. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Is it just, yeah, that's, you said. Yeah, fund I said sewer fund because I was thinking, oh, okay. This is a GIS program for the water system. For the water for the system, side. yes, for okay. the south side. Okay. And so we have to figure, I was thinking sewer fund. Boy, my brain is shot. Okay. Maybe we don't need to do it. Do we have money in that? If we don't have it, it'll be in that appropriate, that wonderful appropriation ordinance that Jim is moving through. <laughs> It might be all committed. He usually knows how much money he has and has it all lined up. The last thing we're just starting on, and this is something that maybe there will be larger discussions on. Debbie has a lot of paper that's about an inch yeah, thick much. on her desk, and she's going to forward it to Paula and we'll kill some more trees. I personally don't want a copy of it myself. But we have to do a stormwater management um, plan, a stormwater utility. There's two parts to it. The first part is one that has four chapters. And this is going to be a bit of a problem. And I don't know, maybe the planning commission or the planner or somebody can come to grips with it. There's f the four chapters that are specified by the state of Ohio, and we've been able to dodge this bullet up until now. Um, but now we have to adopt a stormwater management plan. The first chapter says erosion and sediment control, which means that we're going to be working on yet another set of standards that may or may not dovetail with the land development ordinance and subdivision. You know, and I remember when we were working on uh, watching um, the uh, uh, summit. At, you know, they, we'll read one ordinance, get one message, read another one, get another message. And so I see this as maybe a slight problem, but we'll see. You know, I, somebody's going to have it. Debbie has it. We'll send it to you. Okay. The second chapter, and it's not very thick, but is illicit discharge and connection elimination. Once again, I do believe we have this already in our code of ordinances. So here we are, trying to make a dovetail. And you know, what, you know who doesn't need any more work? So <laughs> somebody's going to have to figure out how to do this. Enforcement of water quality ordinance. I think we already do that, and I think it's already in place. And then definitions. So um, sometime this summer, this little this ordinance will be out, and. Accompanying this will be a stormwater utility charge for lots that are covered with impervious surface. And I believe the planner might be working on dealing with impervious surfaces. I think he's been way. discussing the idea of changing um, lot coverage in general yeah. to cover both. Right now, you know, lot coverage talks about the accessory structures, decks, and houses. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to include, of course, impervious surfaces in terms of uh, driveways and uh, concrete pads. Mm -hmm. Um, how that would, uh, permeable surfaces is kind of a, you know, unless you do a perk test and you have a definition, you either do a definition or you just start talking about whether it's clay or something like that. But I think, I think we'll stick with just what's not green at this point, what's yeah. paved, and so that will include gravel, I believe. We've talked about green bricks before, but we won't bring that up because it's just too complicated for this topic. Well, you can fine tune it, right? Yeah, and it doesn't really work well here. I've, I, I've addressed in the past two years, I've, I've approached Andy a couple times saying, okay, permeable surfaces in terms of asphalt, and they make mm -hmm. permeable asphalt and concrete. Again, you're limited by um, two factors. One, a low water table or a flat surface. Mm -hmm. So um, either you, what we have is we have flat areas that have a high water table, and then we have surfaces that aren't level. I mean, between the hills and the floodplain, we don't have much to work with. So, so we'll probably just stick with a definition of what's permeable and go from there. Yeah, I think we can just, yeah, I and, agree. And, and again, this is a conversation is that stormwater doesn't, uh, stormwater management and the cost for us, our stormwater system is not covered by any particular fund line. It's half in, it comes out of streets, it comes out of sewer and nowhere, and We're it's a stepchild. We'll be creating that this summer. Okay. Won't be much except in places that are totally covered in asphalt. Um, and that will be the way we will maintain 
those systems going forward. The sewer fund, the sanitary sewer fund has been doing this for taking care of this topic for many years. So we've owned, um, Debbie just has the paper, just got it from Mandy. She's gonna be working with Lisa on it and with other people. But one of the things that I was wondering with respect to impermeable surfaces, and I will stop after that, um, is my neighbors and my constituents would really like to have quite a bit of distance between the street and the, and the um, gravel paved. They would like, you know, because theoretically, if you put in a gravel driveway, there's no um, runoff, and yet there's big hunks of gravel in the street by each of these items. And so they'd like a way to keep the gravel in the gravel driveway parking place. Are you talking about um, a, a concrete apron for the yes. driveway? Okay. Yeah. There is legislation out there in various places. I, I know my father was fighting his township in Massachusetts about how far he wanted to put the, the skirt there. Right. I, I think with, with our pedestrian what? situation, other than the gravel that's coming from the gravel trucks in the winter, this is a dangerous thing, these pieces of gravel out in the road for both bicyclists and walkers. And so while we're hitting the impervious surface, I hope we can attack that at the same time. I know some people that are concerned. I mean, they twist their feet, they trip over it, especially, especially people that aren't so steady. Even drivers. Even drivers. Going down yeah. the hill when you have yeah. this gravel on concrete. So this is, if we get beyond... Um, People on roofs and noise ordinances, this is a, sort of a coming attraction. <laughs> okay. And you think it's going to be easy? It won't be. Yeah. Uh, Did I forget something? The miscellaneous, um, I brought the uh, uh, spring cleanup to 2010 statistics. I didn't know oh, if you wanted to report on that or not. Do you want me to see that? Please. Um, 2010 spring cleanup, uh, we received the statistics back from the Athens Hawking Recycling Center. Bottom line was less volume of trash, far less cost associated with that, and the volume at the service garage was also down as well as the tonnage of scrap metal. It's kind of a mixed blessing. I don't know if the message just didn't get out or since we're doing it annually, um, people are participating on a regular basis and, and what have you. Um, the tonnage was down by about 32.93 tons overall, which also results in a, a a net revenue loss for the recycling center of around $7,800 from that. But they also indeed did pick up 25.82 tons of additional trash and refuse and get that out of the system. So. And that's the equivalent of maybe three passenger trucks, pretty close to it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot. Even though I was wondering if it was even working, because it seemed like it wasn't. there wasn't a lot of garbage, or I mean, stuff out there. Yeah, I Except for <laughs> I'm through. On to you. Uh, I had a, just a quick comment on that yeah. last item. Um, someone contacted me, and I take advantage of spring cleanup when, each year. Um, I know a lot of people do. They wondered if we could, if the city could look into dovetailing um, some sort of reuse um, service or pickup along with that, or at least in the media, um, you know, the week before pickup reusables, and then and then there will be the spring cleanup period after that. So. That, and we also, and I think you mentioned this last year, every year we get the question about that household hazardous waste right. being, you know, it would make so much sense to have it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, within that same mm -hmm. week that we do that. But you don't want to be picking that up, do you? We, you know how it is. We have the haulers come in and do right. that. Yeah. We'll just have to. So just an idea okay. for the future to keep in mind. And just, we did, one year we had even special colored bags for reuse during when the student move out came. And we had a problem with, um, and that was the maybe earlier times, but they'd be out really early, 5 o'clock in the morning, and sometimes the things that were designated didn't get picked up. So I, it's relatively complex, but if we could get around it, fuchsia bags or something, I don't know, or fuchsia tags for reuse. Mm -hmm. I hope all of you out there who are thinking about doing um, disposing of your single bed or your bunk bed or the tables that you that aren't broken or anything like that, consider reuse. It's important. But boy, we, we'll see how it goes. I think, doesn't Ed have a program? Yeah. Uh, we do yes. a good move out program, and, move out and program. I, will, I can get that to you, and maybe you can, for the next committee meeting, along with it. Sure. Mm -hmm. It we'll probably needs to, to go on. We're, we're actually providing about $1,000 towards this efforts um, for 
bags, as it were. And you're right, we have a vulture problem about move out. So people were putting their tags on it saying reuse or volunteer, um, Salvation Army. Or, or, Is Salvation Army involved too? Those kind of uh, groups, and they'd be gone. And reuse would be coming, or whoever they had called. It's like, where's that piece of appliance or furniture, so. It gets reused, it's just a different <laughs> <laughs> It does get reused, right. There is a flyer that's been put out. I know they just put one out uh, about a couple weeks ago. I saw it went to the Neighborhood Associations. I don't know where it is. It was also, it was in the A News as an advert. Okay, yeah. Keep, get copies to keep saying it so everybody remembers. Yeah. And they're calling it a move out fast. Thought they might get part of the Oh, that's a blight, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. That's one you would sanction. <laughs> okay, um, for planning and development committee, I just have one short thing. Um, I will be putting forward the ordinance for the uptown rezoning. Um, on Monday, um, and we did um, discuss changing it and trying to amend it. Um, however, I think with uh, with the issues that we've been faced with, with um, up increased density and all the issues that have come up from the numerous meetings that we've had, committee meetings and public hearings about this, um, I will put it forward as per recommendation from the PC, the Planning Commission. Um, and personally, I don't think that trying to um, amend it, it's bad form to amend a zoning um, process, so I want to put it forward. I agree. That Jim was brilliant in what he said. <laughs> don't look behind. <laughs> if you said it earlier and we've talked that week, I would. So look for that on Monday. And that's all I have. Um, is that is that a three reading yes. ordinance? Yes. That's right. Here goes. That's it then. Right. Thanks.